rather than trying to have the Great Commission be a launch to for some thing in the end times, but to actually see it as one of the motivating verses within the, the full counsel of God, while we do believe every aspect of the Great Commission, why is it so important to keep it within its base of other motivating verses of mission to give us a holistic idea? And what happens if we just isolate it at the exclusion of the others? Yes, I think it is important. Um, it's important exegetically simply because this is the way Matthew chooses to close his gospel. Um, but he, he, it's not all he had to say. I mean, it is the climax of a whole uh, scroll, the scroll of Matthew, which clearly has shown who Jesus is, the son of Abraham, the son of David. So he's the, the man for all nations. Abraham is the King David's son. So he's the Messiah King. Uh, and then you get all the, the life and works and teaching of Jesus. So if Jesus says, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, you'd have to look back through Matthew's gospel and say, well, what did Jesus command his disciples? And he didn't only command them to go out and evangelize the world. Uh, he commanded them to be those who would be uh, works of compassion and love and forgiveness and healing. Um, you know, there's there's so much in just Matthew alone, apart from the rest of the New Testament, about the way Christians are supposed to be living rather than simply about what we're saying, that to treat the Great Commission as simply to do with the preaching of the gospel or even just the teaching of the doctrines or something um, seems to me to be illogical because Jesus didn't just say, teach them all that I taught you, as if it was just transfer my teaching to their heads from your head. He says, teaching them to obey all that I commanded you, which which brings it right down to practical living, to actually living out the gospel, becoming the gospel, to use the phrase that Michael Gorman has used as a title of one of his books. So therefore, I think that is one reason why the Great Commission, even just in Matthew. But the other thing I would say about the, as I say in my book, is that the phraseology that Jesus uses in these closing words are thoroughly Deuteron Deuteronomic. That's to say they're rooted in the book of Deuteronomy at several levels. First of all, the opening gambit, uh, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That, you know, to, for any human being to say that is basically adopting the Yahweh position. Because in Deuteronomy, Moses says to Israel, Israel, you need to know that Yahweh, the Lord your God, is God in heaven above and on the earth beneath, and there is no other. And here's Jesus saying, guys, you know who I am now. I'm the Lord of heaven and earth, the God of all creation. So that, that is a cosmic reality, uh, which has to do with God's whole purposes for all creation, um, if you see what I mean. In other words, a, it's a connection right back to the creational language of Deuteronomy and indeed of Genesis. And when he says, teach them to observe all that I've commanded you, that again is pure Deuteronomy. It's what Moses or God say again and again. Be careful, O Israel, to obey all that I, the Lord your God, am commanding you this day. And that whole scriptural element of the commands of God have massive amounts of what kind of people they were to be in their social, economic, political, legal, family life. Uh, and so if, if, if Jesus is, in a sense, um, passing on uh, transmuting, as it were, the, the ethics of the Old Testament scriptures. He's effectively saying to his disciples, I want you to be what Israel was really supposed to be, according to God's law. And then I want you to create replicating communities of obedience, uh, which is why Paul talks about the obedience of faith. Uh, so that profoundly transformative life element is intrinsic to the Great Commission. It's not just something that comes afterwards. You know, get people saved first, and then we'll see what happens. Which is one reason why I agree with you that I don't. I think the language of quote fulfilling the Great Commission suggests that it, you know it's a kind of ticking clock. You know that it, to do with the people we happen to have reached with the gospel. Now, again, I don't want to be misunderstood here for anybody who's listening because. I do not want to be heard to be disparaging those whose passion it is from God that the Christian church is way behind where we ought to be in terms of reaching to people who've never yet heard the gospel, that there is a reality in our world uh, of peoples and groups and languages and hope, you know, who have no connection with 
the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is wrong and scandalous. So, yes, we should be doing that. But to make the Great Commission, in a sense, refer only to that, as if to say, Jesus is sort of waiting until we've reached the last um, people on earth, and then he can come back, is not really even what Jesus, he didn't say just evangelizing, he says, disciple the nations, make disciples. And so when I think of my own country here, Britain, you know, Britain was reached with the gospel within the first century. Um, but does that mean that Britain is discipled? Of course not. I mean, you know, that even the church in this country needs to be re-discipled. So uh, to turn the Great Commission into a sort of a, a mechanism for human effort in order to somehow accomplish something for God, I, I think is is diminishing its its impact in terms of uh, what God is calling his whole community of disciples to be and to do in the world. And a recent conversation I had with some good friends from Lausanne, and of course, as you know, Lausanne 4 is coming up in uh, in Seoul in South Korea in September this year, and I'm, I'll be going. I'm not involved particularly in any way, but I was asked to, to, to comment on the big document that has been prepared for Lausanne, which has the title, The State of the Great Commission. And I struggle a bit with that phrase because it suggests that the Great Commission is, again, somehow a, a management task that we have to accomplish. And what is the state of it? How far have we got in accomplishing this? But it also made me think of, well, if Jesus says, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, what's the state of that in the global church? We can't just ask, what's the state of the Great Commission in terms of how many more peoples are still to be reached with the gospel? How many people have we reached with the gospel since the last Lausanne Congress or something like that? In other words, simply a, a kind of metric of evangelistic um, success and so on, which is important. It's not can't just be about that if the Great Commission actually includes the language of teaching to obey what Jesus has commanded. How well are we obeying Jesus? You know, what's happening um, in some countries in the world today where evangelical Christians are divided politically, who are going after all kinds of idolatries, what sort of obedience is that? What would one call about the state of the obedience to the Great Commission wh when you look at some forms of evangelical Christianity, especially in the West? Now, that that is a question that I don't think the state of the Great Commission, as a phrase, is asking.